coming up tonight on Wales at Six. But first, if you live in Newport, Newport West to be exact, polling stations will be open on the 4th of April to elect a new MP. The by-election has been called following the death of veteran Labour MP Paul Flynn. There are 11 candidates and our political reporter Sean Jenkins has been asking people who live there what issues matter to them the most. Westminster is a very noisy place at the moment. But in the midst of all the loud voices, it's easy to forget that there's one Welsh constituency which is currently voiceless. Newport West is a seat which Labour's Paul Flynn took from the Conservatives in 1987 and which he held on to until his death last month. At the last election in 2017, Flynn won with a majority of just over 8,000 votes and had built up a very strong personal following. But on the 4th of April, the voters here will head to the polls to elect his successor. You're going to vote? Yeah. yeah. Do you oh, know yeah. how you, which party you vote for? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Labour. Labour. I vote for UKIP. You vote for UKIP? Yeah. Why will you, why will you vote for UKIP? I don't trust the mainstream, uh, I don't trust the mainstream parties no more. I've always been a lifelong Tory. I will not vote for him ever again in my lifetime. Because of Brexit? Mainly because of Brexit. They've totally ignored it with the people. They've ignored their own agenda in the last elections, campaigns and they're unfortunately pushing people like myself into the extreme parties. After Paul Flynn's excellent performance for the last uh, God knows how long, uh, I'd be supporting the Labour Party. I understand that, Steve, from the DVP. I know the deal with John Rhys Evans and, and talking sure. about direct democracy and the Swiss model, absolutely. Yeah. We've covered it on the show, and some of these folks, including John, uh, John Rhys Evans, has been on Daily Brexit. Yes, we're also yeah. very interested in working with like-minded people. Until we get this Brexit uh, sorted out, we're very happy to be working with like-minded groups. Uh, and it, it, it concerns me when, when, when there are people who are just going off on their own little tangent. Forget about the egos. Some people. Another Eurosceptic party standing will be the Democrats and veterans. We're about direct democracy and applying the will of the people, which isn't what's being done at the moment. And despite this being a Westminster by-election, they abolished the Welsh Assembly Party. I've actually been speaking with a lot of people who actually even admitted to me that they voted uh, Remain uh, in the past. They said this is no longer about Remain or leaving the EU. This is about democracy. democracy. This is about democracy. And what we're offering as a party is the Swiss style of direct democracy. The Labour candidate hoping to follow in the footsteps of Paul Flynn is Ruth Jones. But will she be able to ride the wave of Flynn's success and keep Newport West red? Well, there are a few issues. Crime is one of them. Universal credits, uh, PIP, you know, the, how people are being affected by these things adversely, and those are really important issues here. You didn't mention Brexit there. Have you not heard an awful lot about Brexit on the doorstep? It's variable. Some people are, you know, talking about Brexit, but obviously um, things that are going on in the House, I can't influence. So, you know, we're having to say, yeah, we hear what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm only a candidate at the moment. So I said, Mrs. Davis, I know One man who's being bombarded with Brexit questions is the Leave voting Conservative candidate, Matthew Evans. He says he's trying to concentrate on local issues, such as the M4 relief road and council tax rises. Are you embarrassed to have to campaign for a party that's made such a mess of Brexit? Well, I'd so, say so all politicians ought to be ashamed of themselves at the moment. It's not just about the Conservative Party. And I'm knocking on doors here, and there's a lot of people who say exactly the same about all politicians. I campaigned for, for, to, to leave the European Union, um, and I want to ensure that we do. But I understand people who wanted to remain. But the vast majority of people I see on the doorstep don't want a second referendum. They don't want another general election. They want us to get on and do it. But for the Lib Dems, a second referendum is an absolute must. On Brexit, we're looking for a people's vote. That's what we're pushing for as a party nationally. And most importantly, we're campaigning, particularly in Newport, for infrastructure. We need increased spending to help get Newport moving again. Thank you very much. Something which many say would get Newport moving again is the M4 relief road. But for the Plaid Cymru candidate, that isn't the answer. If they build the M4 relief road, that could be £2 billion which will just be lost to build a project that's never really going to deliver for the people of Newport, let alone the people of South Wales. On the 4th of April, we've got a real opportunity to do something different and radical in Newport, and that radical alternative is Plaid Cymru. UKIP have announced they are now anti-devolution, but Brexit as ever is at the top of their candidate Neil Hamilton's agenda. 
I say to any Brexiteer in Newport, if you really want to force Theresa May and the EU into a corner and get what we voted for two and a half years ago, vote for me. And for the Greens, it's all about their Green New Deal. That'll be about making sure that we alleviate poverty through investment and jobs, making sure we have a sustainable transport network rather than a new M4 relief road, and making sure that we're tackling things like energy. As well as the usual suspects, there are also a few lesser-known parties hoping to capitalise on the current political turmoil. Renew are the new kids on the block. They describe themselves as a party of people from outside politics who've come together to fix the problems of a post-Brexit UK. We really need to find ways of joining up the dots, really, to make sure that all the different parts of our democracy in Wales, the local authorities and Parliament are working together, and that's what we stand for. As well as the emergence of new parties, this by-election will also see a blast from the past in the form of the SDP. Well, the SDP these days is um, a Eurosceptic party, so we believe in um, Brexit. It's all about common sense politics for DC. will also feature on the ballot paper, and as their name suggests, they're standing to promote one thing and one thing only. Our one only policy, and that's the abolition of the Welsh Assembly. And Hugh Nicklin is standing for the For Britain movement. A total of 11 candidates standing on April the 4th when the people of Newport West will decide who they want as their voice in the Commons. This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is a download from the BBC. For more information, visit bbc.co.uk slash Radio Wales. You're listening to Sunday Supplement, our weekly digest of political news, views and gossip, which you can listen to live on BBC Radio Wales on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock. Borida, good morning. I'm Vaughan Roderick. Well, Tempest Fugit this morning. The clocks may have sprung forward an hour, but it's still Groundhog Day when it comes to our politics, with Brexit dominating our political discourse. Well, we'll be discussing that and some other subjects with the candidates contesting the Newport West parliamentary by-election today. Yes, in this special programme, we'll be hearing the views of the people vying to be Westminster's newest MP. The contest was, of course, triggered by the death of Paul Flynn, who'd been the local MP since 1987. Now, no fewer than 11 candidates are contesting the seat and we'll be hearing from all of them during the course of the programme. Well, election tellers at the ready, it's almost time for voters to put stubby pencil to ballot paper in the Newport West parliamentary by-election. Thursday is the big day, although obviously those who registered for a postal ballot may already have voted. Throughout the programme, we'll be considering the views of the 11 candidates, yes, 11, standing for election in the Port City. Now, a full list of candidates is available on the BBC Wales Politics website. Uh, Joining us live today on the programme are six of them. You'll be hearing from the other candidates a little bit later, but taking part live are the candidates from parties currently represented in the House of Commons, the National Assembly or the European Parliament. Six of them have made the cut, candidates representing Labour, the Conservatives, Plaid Cymru, the Liberal Democrats, UKIP and the Greens. I'll introduce them as we go along, and as this is a discussion, not a debate, there are no stopwatches running, but I will try and ensure that all of them get a fair hearing. Well, there are no prizes for guessing what the first topic is. Yes, it's Brexit. And in time-honoured practice for these programmes, we've pulled the names out of a hat to establish the order in which our guests answer these questions. Um, And suitably enough for Brexit, it's UKIP who go first. Uh, Neil Hamilton uh, is here, leader of UKIP in Wales, as well as their candidate in the by-election. Your answer is the most straightforward one, I think. You would leave yesterday... Friday, if you could, uh, with no deal. Am I right? Yeah, well, I joined the Anti-Common Market League in 1967. I didn't want to go in in the first place, so I would have left almost before we joined. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yes, I mean, 56% of people in the city of Newport voted to leave. And, uh, of course, they haven't got what they voted for. We have not left the European Union three years later. And both Labour and the Conservatives have failed people of Newport in this and many other respects. Um... How have they failed them? Aren't they just doing their job? 
well, the referendum was called uh, to delegate to the people, if you like, uh, the decision which the House of Commons felt itself unable to make for whatever but, but, but reason. But it was an advisory referendum, not a binding plebiscite. Well, if it was advisory and the government saw, thought that they could ignore the advice of the people, then I think they were making a big mistake. No, I think that's a rather sophistical argument. The whole purpose of the referendum was to ask the people what they thought, and the government said quite clearly in the booklet that they sent at our expense to every single household in the country that the government would implement what the people decided. They have failed to do that. And now the other parties are trying to reverse the result of the referendum. Uh, Were you at the demonstration on Friday? No, I was in Newport. Um, I I want to be very careful here because there was a UKIP demonstration and there were other demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to to tie UKIP with a a more general brush. But there were some pretty unpleasant scenes there, weren't there? I mean... well, I didn't watch it, actually, but, but uh, you know, demonstrations are unpredictable. That's, uh, but but, but it, there was a stark contrast, I thought, with the, with, with the People's Vote demonstration the, the, the previous week, which was a, a million people which seemed good-humoured, law-abiding. You know, shots of... And as I say, I don't know if this was the UK demonstration or not. Someone dragging effigies of Sadiq Khan and Theresa May across the pavement. You know, well, I can't answer People sh- shouting and screaming at journalists. I wasn't there and I didn't see no, it. So. I, no, I'm, 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 I'm sure you won't and I'm sure you don't approve of that sort no. of thing. But, but it has unleashed something unpleasant, it seems to me. Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've had uh, you know, very strong views on both sides of this argument for many, many years. And yes, there are nasty people in a country of 65 million people, but the legitimate parties and candidates can't be responsible for the behaviour of irresponsible individuals who have nothing to do with them. Um, Jonathan Clark, what, what do you make uh, of, of Neil's point that having had the rep- re- referendum, it's, it's the responsibility of politicians to respect the result? I think, yes, we have to respect the result of the referendum, but what people voted for a couple of years ago was never actually clearly defined. So what Plyde has always advocated is a people's vote, where people are given a sensible choice and realistic alternatives rather than just crashing out, which is pretty much what we've been offered by the current government. Uh, uh, yet, you know, you can see, I, I can see the logical argument for a two, two-phase referendum, but that should have been said before the first one. That, uh, that's what it appears to me, that, you know, it does look like the loser saying, let's play best of three. No, I, don't, I, t- I disagree with you that that was never... The referendum was a simple choice, stay or leave. There was no detail, there was no substance, there was no explanation of what the consequences would be. It was based to a great extent on Project Fear, with both sides to a degree trying to scare people. That's not the basis for making a sensible decision. That's why we believe and have long advocated and worked towards that people should be given a choice of options as where we're going to go. That's not a case of not respecting the referendum. It's actually supplying some detail. Yeah, uh, you, see, you see, the problem I have with, it, with, with that is this. It, it, it's, it's totally... Oh, referendum mandates don't last forever. You know, Neil lost a, re- a, a, a referendum in um, 1975, and he could argue against to, re- to reverse the consequences of that referendum. But doesn't the mandate have to be fulfilled before you can argue that? that you, you know, once we're out, you can argue to go back in, but to argue to stop the mandate... I'm not sure that's what people are actually arguing when, it, when we educate the people's vote. It is about giving people sensible choices, sensible options... So we can make a, a more informed decision about the consequences. It's not a case of not leaving; it's the manner. Um, Matthew Evans, um, there have been free votes on this, uh, and discipline has broken down to a great degree in the Conservative Party. So people will be interested to know where you personally stand on this. Not not what the party line is, but where you personally yep, stand. Yeah, absolutely. No, I've been very very clear about this. But what I will say is, on the doorstep at the moment. People are sick and tired of the situation nationally. They're fed up. The last thing they want is another people's vote or even worse, a general election. Um, and I've been very clear. I voted to leave and I think we, we should leave. And uh, we are very frustrated and, and angry, not with just the Conservative Party at the UK, but, but with the Labour Party and all of the politicians up in, in London. Um, it's very clear we need to honour the results of the referendum. So, so when the, uh, those indicative votes were being held, if, if the by-election had been a fortnight ago and you'd already been there, 
Um, how would you have voted in the indicative votes, which was, as I say, was a free vote for Conservatives? To be honest, I haven't even looked in the details of all these votes at the moment. I'd be busy talking to residents in Newport. Um, but but you, you so, know, no, no to a people's vote. Um, customs union? No, no to a customs union. If we, I mean, when I was knocking on doors and campaigning to leave the European Union, it was quite clear that people wanted the clarity. They wanted to ensure we could trade around the world, control immigration... And with a customs union, for instance, we wouldn't be able to make our own trade arrangements. So I think it's very clear that we should be honouring the result of the referendum. Um, so, Theresa May's deal or no deal? I think Theresa May's deal is the only deal on the table which will honour the result of the referendum. It's not perfect, but I think it's the only, res- only deal there which would ensure we don't spend the next two years talking about it or in an already divided country. But it doesn't do that at all. We haven't started to discuss the future of our relationship with the EU. The whole point of the two-year period after triggering Article 50 was to get to a point where we'd already reached an agreement with the EU about our future trading relationship. We haven't even got to the starting block, so that will just perpetuate uncertainty. Uh, Let me turn to Ruth Jones. Uh, Again, Ruth, you know, there are a lot of Labour MPs who've been breaking the whip. There are some votes that haven't been whipped. So so I'd like to ask you, uh, point blank, your personal view, not, not the party policy, but your personal view. Well, it's no secret that in 2016 I was part of the Labour team in Newport who were out campaigning to remain. Um, It was Labour Party policy then. Um, It's not, you know, it's very clear to me that the the actual uh, referendum was called by David Cameron, the then Prime Minister, in an attempt to sort of uh, silence his right wing elements of his party. So that was the reason he called it. And I feel we've all been held as pawns, if you like, in his game. He's now gone off into the sunset, marvellous, leaving us with a mess. And on the doorstep, as Matthew quite rightly says, it is a mess. And everybody is sick and tired of the Brexit cloud, if you like, because it's clouding other issues. But how do you resolve it? And then I think, well, it would be nice if, I mean, Theresa May has spent two and a half years telling us it's her deal, it's her deal, it's her deal. And only now has she come together and said, OK, let's try and get a consensus way forward. It's a little bit late in the day. She spent two and a half years juggling with our future, if you like. And only now, certainly as Labour, been able to get involved in this. So, yes, we do want to get involved because we do want a consensual way forward. Right. Let me let me put the same question to you that I put to Matthew. And uh, I know you haven't got them in front of you, so I'm not saying, oh, I'd vote yes on indicative vote A and no on B. But, but, but broadly, where would you stand on those various options that were put to MPs? I mean, my, my red line, for lack of a better word, is that no deal is not an option. Definitely no deal. I mean, in terms of the indicative votes, things that are coming back now will be changed again, modified and amended. Sure, so it's sure. very difficult to say where we would be on that. And I would I would want some time because, let's be honest, Theresa May's had two and a half years to look at it. She gave Parliament a week. But let, that's not uh, fair. Uh, let, let, let me press you a little bit on, on this, though. Um, <coughs> first of all, we heard um, Jonathan ask, uh, arguing for a third referendum, confirmatory vote, people's vote, whatever we want to call it. Um, are you in favour of that? That's one of the options we have, yes. I'm not asking you whether it's one of the options, I'm asking you whether you're in favour of it. Yeah, I mean, it's not a problem in terms, if if Parliament can't decide, um, and if Parliament still can't make up their mind at the end of the next couple of weeks, then we we would have to look to putting it back to the people. Um, Customs union? Yes, some form of a customs union, that's another option that we would consider. Common market (laughs) 2.0? <laughs> yes, that's another one Stephen Kinnock has been involved with, yes. And it, it's it's one of those things that, again, I can't give you... I don't have the detail in front of me, as Matthew said, but it's it's one of those things we would need to look at, and we need time to look at these things uh, to um, make sure we have the best deal for the people of the whole of the UK. Are you, are you, are you more keen on um, the people's vote, so-called people's vote, um, than Jeremy Corbyn is? Because, because, you know, a lot of Labour people I talk to on the ground uh, will privately say... You know, we we should be going for this far far harder than we are. But you know, Jeremy's an instinctive uh, Eurosceptic. He actually, <coughs> on the quiet, favours Brexit. He doesn't wa- he doesn't want this vote. Um, are you keener on it than he is? I don't know because I haven't really discussed how keen he is. But yesterday, when he was down campaigning with us, he was certainly talking about the option of, of people's vote, um, along with all the other things that we we are looking at. Because we need to make sure we have the best for the people of Newport West, which is jobs, making sure we have safe, secure jobs, and that the economy of Newport West doesn't suffer. Um, uh, Amelia Womack. Um, <coughs> I suspect you're going to more or less agree with Jonathan, um, who, who, who's sitting next to you. You're firmly in the people's vote camp. 
Absolutely. You wouldn't sign a contract without knowing the fine print. And now we know the details of this. It's an opportunity to bring that back to the people because Parliament is in gridlock at the moment. And that's why we're seeing the drama that's happening there. The only way we're going to break out of that is by doing something different and putting it back to the people. And for those people who say that it will change the vote, if you've got so confident in that deal and you think it's the best deal for the country, then I don't understand why you wouldn't put it back to the people and check with the people, because all that referendum did was tell us that in 2016, the, a small majority of people wanted to leave. And that was based on the pipe dreams of leave campaigners. And the fact that issues like Northern Ireland have now become clearer about what the, the problems with the border there, um, I think that a lot of people want to have another say to make sure that their voice is heard now that we know what's actually on the table. But, but, but have you thought about the backlash? There might be. If there was a people's vote and the vote was reversed and I'm, I'm referring to um, some of the people I was talking to Neil about earlier you know the people on those demonstrations there would be a deep and genuine anger out there and you know to a degree it would be a justifiable anger the people had been told their decision would be final and here they see the political class taking the decision away from them I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do to repair and rebuild our country and the hate that's uh, be, been seeping out as a result of this um, referendum has be, made it clear that we've got to work hard to make sure we rebuild our communities. But what I think is very clear when you look at Newport is as a city we uh, need to be making sure that we do support our economy, that we are supporting people and it's beyond just Brexit or no Brexit. It's about making sure we're tackling issues like austerity that we're going out and actually asking people why they did vote to leave or remain and make sure that we're building that stronger city because in Newport we are at the mercy of any hit in our economy. We're a city that has um, a lot of civil service jobs with the passport office and with an office for national statistics and when there are government cuts it's our city that gets hurt most and I think we need to be really reflect on what any um, form of Brexit or remain does for, for, our, for our city and making sure that we have the best option to reduce the possibility of any kind of economic hit. Uh, we can't know for sure. Right. But um, I'm willing to bet that some of the leafier parts of Newport West probably voted Remain. And I'm willing to bet that the people of Pill Gwentley overwhelmingly voted to leave. Can, can you understand why they did? So I'd also say on the statistic of the number of people in Newport who voted Remain or Leave, we obviously don't know if that was Newport West. Oh, and oh, so oh, I no, think that yeah, that's, yeah. Um, it is, um, in terms of statistic, I don't think it really reflects this campaign just, entirely. Yeah, but but, 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 I think, but, but um, the point they're making, they're, they're really really deprived, absolutely. desperately and I think poor parts of Newport West. And I suspect they voted leave. Do you understand why? Because they voted politics leave? has been failing people time and time again. And when you've been failed by co- politics, you want to kick back at it. And when you've got a, an opportunity, you will kick back at it. And that's why I want to make sure that we are tackling issues uh, like austerity, making sure that we're bringing th- jobs that are future-proof jobs to Newport, making sure that we're protecting, um, bringing in policies that support people in Newport now and for the future, because there has been that failure of politics time and time again and I think that's as a result of all kinds, you've got to admit that austerity has torn apart the very fabric of our communities and that people have been failed by the political class, not just as a result of of the EU referendum but as a result of years of the fact that Mm. Newport has been forgotten. Um, Let me bring in Ryan Jones, the uh, Liberal Democrat candidate. Hello Ryan. Hello. Um, your party has been very firm ever since the referendum. You, you've been a pro-European party for 50 years, 60 years, and you haven't, you haven't changed. But what do you make of the fact um, that, that I put to Jonathan, really, that, that you can't change the rules of the game at half-time? OK, I, I, I take on board that point. Um, but I think the referendum that was held in 2016, the options were many things to many people. And I think that people voted because they wanted one particular Brexit, but actually their second preference might have been to remain before a no deal. And I think what we need to do now is we need to establish exactly what it is that we can do when we leave. What is that deal that's available? And we need to put that back to the people and say, do you still want this? But, uh, you know, buyer's remorse and all that, uh, you know, I I was saying to Jonathan, a two-stage process would have made total sense, but that should have been spelled out before the process began you can't you can't change the rules now 
I don't think it's so much about changing the rules. What I think it's doing is it is asking people to, to confirm that this is still what they want. After all, democracy isn't a static process. It isn't just a one-time event. It is a process that's constantly evolving. And I think that we need to be in a position where we can take on board the changing views of the electorate. What makes you think the views of the electorate are changing? I mean, it's not reflected in a huge swing to the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> You're right. It, it, it hasn't thus far been reflected that way. But I, I've been spending a lot of time door knocking in Newport West. And while, of course, there are not still people who are very, very, very passionate leavers. But what I am sensing is a lot of people who are saying they voted leave, but they are supporting a, a confirmatory re referendum because they recognise that what they were sold in 2016 isn't what's going to be delivered to them. Thank you. Uh, well, that's Brexit. There are other subjects in this by-election. Uh, we'll discuss them in a moment. Uh, but first, in addition to the candidates taking part live in today's programme, there are five others contesting the by-election. Here are their views. I'm Hugh Nicklin and I represent the For Britain movement. For Britain is pro-European and against the European Union. We are against aspects of Islam and not Islamophobic. We are pro-capitalism and the free market and support the compulsory purchase of land for housing. We regret the pressure on the housing market imposed by mass immigration and are not racist. We delight in the benefits of multiculturalism, such as Egg Foo Young and Chicken Tikka Masala, and are opposed to polygamy and child marriage. We want one law made by a removable parliament and applied equally to everyone, and oppose Sharia law. Hi, I'm Phil Taylor, standing for the Democrats and Veterans Party in the upcoming by-election. We represent direct democracy, giving a voice and a power back to the people, the failed representational democracy that currently exists is showing that it is no longer fit for purpose. We want to bring security to the people of Newport. We want to improve the transport infrastructure and we want to address the shortfallings in the public services. My name is June Davis and I'm the candidate for the Renew Party. We're a new party that's a centrist, moderate and progressive party that's bringing new people from outside politics into the system. So my priorities for Newport West are regeneration. That means building affordable housing, better connected transport networks, new jobs, new investment and of course education starts the whole process off. We must protect the futures of our young people. My name is Richard Sukhachevsky. And I'm the parliamentary candidate for the Abolish the Welsh Assembly Party. All the candidates standing represent political parties with a wide range of policies. We have only one policy, which is to abolish the Welsh Assembly. With that in mind, anyone who votes for us or who votes for me in Newport West will know that I will do their bidding rather than that of the political party that I belong to. My name is Ian McLean. I am standing for the Social Democratic Party. The M4 Relief Road, that is a big concern for everybody. It is definitely needed and our party will support the Relief Road, although it is a devolved matter. Homelessness is a big problem. Some pop-up shelters now have been built in Newport and we fully support those, although we would look towards a more permanent solution. The other issue is the decline in commercial street, high street part of the town. We would like to see a lot of inward investment in those areas. Well, those are the candidates who aren't with us for the live debate this morning. And a reminder that you can see a full list of all the candidates in the Newport West by-election on the BBC Wales politics site. Well... Let's move on. And we're going to move on to an issue which, as was mentioned there, is actually a devolved issue. It's a decision that will be taken in Cardiff Bay, but it's no doubt the hottest local issue in Newport at the moment. And that's the proposed M4 relief road. And we start again having selected candidates in the order that their names were pulled out of a hat with the Green Party's Amelia Womack. I, I, I feel there was a, a hand of God guiding <laughs> this uh, hand into the, into the hat, having started Brexit with UKIP and the M4 Relief Road with the, uh, the Green Party. Um, you hate this, don't you? 
Well, what I do like is sustainable transport and making sure that we've got the, the easiest, cheapest option in, our, in public transport, making sure that the 28% of people in Newport who don't have a car or van have an opportunity to get where they're going that's uh, reliable and easy. And that it does come from Westminster as well, making sure that we electrify our railways, making sure that we've got the opportunities to build a public transport network. Because what, what we see, um, what evidence proves time and time again, is new roads just create new traffic, which means that the promises of traffic reduction are never met. Um, it, what we need is to be removing those cars off the road, freeing it up for those essential journeys that people who are unable to use public transport can take um, without the same congestion. Um, it, it's half past eight on a Sunday morning and for most people it's half past seven, so the Bringlas tunnels are probably reasonably um, <laughs> quiet at the moment, but uh, you know, if you're, we've all had the frustration I guess, and we, yeah. you know, of, 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 of sitting there uh, of missing appointments, of um, business people unable to go at their business, manufacturers unable to deliver their goods you know, doing nothing is not an option uh, and nice trams Linking Cardiff and Newport may take some traffic off the road, but probably not enough. So you're right, and doing nothing isn't an option. And the fact that we've been waiting for 25 years to get something clear on this with no uh, positive steps taken. But the thing is that the, the roads that have been creating were a 1950s vision. And what we need is a vision for the 21st century. And that is about uh, buses, trains, trams, cycling, walking. These are options to get people out of their cars, get cars off the road and free up that space on the road and to make sure that we are reducing congestion. And this has been proven as the best way to relieve congestion. If you look at the Newbury Bypass, for, for example, um, the promises of reduced traffic there have never met what they said they were going to meet. And what we need a vision. I think I feel like for Wales, we really do need that vision of what the 21st century looks like for us. And I don't think that's a 1950s road building programme. You, you see, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure that that applies yet. Listen, there's a huge commuter belt, right, of people coming down from Islu in, into Newport West, and that's continually clogged as well. And I can see how having the Ebu Vale line going into Newport would ease that particular sort of congestion. But I don't see how it does it for the M4. I think well, there are a number of different stations that can be opened. There are so many different ways that we can take people off the roads. And I think that we, we are just, um, if we continue to just uh, put, uh, first of all, if we do put a relief road in, I do think it's interesting we don't call it the Newport Bypass. I do think it's the Newbury Bypass connotations that might mean that we do that. It will effectively bypass Newport, and I don't think that helps our economy either. So we, um, the fact that there is evidence that, that, could, that there are these different options of buses as well as trams can relieve it. We need to look into that mm. as well. Um, Jonathan Clark, the last time this idea was kicking around, it, it was Yeo Wynne Jones as um, Deputy First Minister who kicked it into the long grass or, yeah, or, or into the reins or, or wherever yeah. it went. And, and, sensi and a sensible decision that was. I mean, what we're being sold with the M4 relief road isn't. When it was proposed 30 years ago, before we now know what we know as a result of Newbury, the M5, the M6, the M25, the fact if you build and expand highways, they will fill with traffic. When it was proposed 30 years ago, there were no motorway junctions on it. They're now proposing to put four motorway junctions on it, to either side of the river. That's going to recreate exactly the same problem we have the existing well, M4. people using it for local commutes. Yeah, everybody, so. everybody who lives in Newport one way or another is guilty of using the M4 for short journeys. That's not what motorways are designed for. The curse of having all those motorway junctions, a lack of alternative infrastructure, simple failures over generations by either by the local council or by Labour or Conservative governments have led to this becoming a significant problem. For example, in Killian and Pontia, there are about 12,000 people living there. The railway station plan for Killian has been in the structure plan since 1986. Nothing has been done. Those people have no option but to drive because the bus service in Newport is pretty much dysfunctional. Bus and service shouldn't even sit in the same sentence. If we look at what's already being planned on the Landworm site, five to 7,000 houses, they haven't even built the railway station. Those people will have no option but to drive. We're feeding into the problem. Two, we've watched the costs grow from 800 million to nearly 2 billion. I've been lectured to, talked to, talked at by enough civil engineers to know you can put 25% on top of that to start with. It's not going to deliver. £2 billion 
would absolutely transform transport in southern Wales beyond our wildest dreams. Simple <coughs> wins, simple incremental wins with the metro would make significant differences to how people get around and how they go to work. If you live in Rogerstone and you work in Bristol or Gloucester or Cheltenham or beyond, you have no option but to drive. Even if they built the relief road, that wouldn't affect that whatsoever. The other thing we need to look at, at times, a third of the traffic on the M4 is freight. Let's be brutally honest, if you're shipping a container from Swansea to Hamburg, it shouldn't be on the M4. Our distribution system is flawed. It's become last minute, last minute delivery. We have to change that. We have to take a holistic view, look at proper, decent, integrated transport, give the 100,000 mm. people who move around Newport every day realistic alternatives to get to and from work without having to drive. Right. Uh, two very strong voices against. Um, let's go to the Lib Dem. Uh, Ryan Jones, where are you on this one, Ryan? Uh, I, I think uh, I, I, uh, I, I couldn't disagree more, actually. I think what we, we do need is we need an M4 relief road. Um, I run a business in Newport and we see that one slight bump near the Bringlass tunnels and the entire city is gridlocked. We've got HGVs coming through the uh, the city centre um, causing absolute chaos and, and, and not allowing people to get to work. Uh, and, uh, and one of the alternatives that, that you will know has been proposed is the so-called Blue Route, which is upgrading the ring road, basically, so, mm. as the, so as that takes some of the pressure off. That wouldn't work, you don't think? I, I think the uh, the SDR, uh, the, 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 the current alignment that would become the Blue Route, is not fit for purpose as it is. Um, I think anyone who's driven uh, on that road during rush hour will see that it's essentially a, a car park. And I think um, making uh, changes to that, such as widening it, uh, it isn't really going to help the situation. It would provide, the argument is it would provide relief when the M4 was actually closed. You know, the, 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 the nightmare scenario at the moment is when the tunnels shut. Mm, yeah. um, and, and it would provide some sort of alternative, not a brilliant one, but some sort of alternative. <laughs> some sort of alternative. I think, um, I think what, 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 we, uh, what we need to be, be clear about here is the current M4 alignment uh, is not fit for purpose. Um, it, it, and what we actually need is a suitable uh, M4 uh, route. And I think that is the only, the only way that that is offered is with the Black Route. Uh, Matthew Evans, I, I, I suspect it's going to become too all <laughs> when I ask you. Um, you've put this fairly prominently in your campaign literature that this is one of the things you want to see delivered, even though it ultimately is a Cardiff Bay decision. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been waiting 20 years for a decision on this. It's incredibly frustrating. Businesses have been crying out for this. And residents I speak to in Newport are sick and tired of the delays. And I'm not against public transport. And clearly, you know, things like the Ebervale to Newport Rail Link, um, I've been campaigning for that to be done since 2002. And if they can't get a three mile piece of rail link done over that 16 year period, it's a that pretty is, sorry that indictment. Is so frustrating. It, it is a sorry it, indictment it, of the Welsh it, Labour government that they haven't managed to even do a simple little thing like that. So, so yeah. are you confident they could deliver the M4 relief route? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a very good question. I'm not particularly confident um, on that. But clearly, we can't just stay where we are. We need to make a decision. And I was leader of the council in 2009 or 10 when Yarn and Wynne Jones, we went down there and we had all this fanfare we were going to finally get on and, and do it had they done it then it would have saved an awful lot of money from current situation and people are just fed up and for many people cars are a necessity not a luxury um and so while well, i'm in favor of that don't forget buses and coaches also use the roads as well and businesses just need to the reassurance i mean we've got the new convention center opening at the celtic manor welsh government didn't plan any sort of public transport linked to that so again people have to that that is a point and it's a point that was made earlier isn't it is it's the danger of a bypass is that it takes people elsewhere you know and, and i remember when, when the Ryder cup was in newport people said you know it promised it was going to do great things for the city and it sort of didn't really um and isn't that the danger that newport as a city, is just bypassed and forgotten. People just drive past it. No, no far from it. And if you look at all the businesses which are along the M4 corridor currently around Klepper Park and things like that, all these new businesses who want to have... Newport's got good road and rail links and they need to be improved. People want that. Businesses want to be by the side. So they're key access of transport. So um, 
And the Ryder Cup did actually produce about £28 million mm. pounds worth of benefits. But, but to you're, the city. You, you, yeah, the, the, that is correct. But yeah. the, the perception people felt in Newport wasn't that, was it? Yeah, and I can, I can under, understand that. But uh, it did actually benefit the city uh, on, a, on a global scale. So. Um, Neil, where are you on this? Well, I fought the last assembly election in support of the blue route, not the black route. But um, this is all academic because the black route is never going to be built because if it costs £2 billion, the Welsh government simply doesn't have enough money to do it. You know, their, t- their, their total borrowing power is limited to £1 billion, So where's the extra money going to come from? Uh, it isn't going to happen. We should be taking, I think, the approach that uh, Jonathan... Um, uh, was talking about earlier on is a sensible one, and Amelia as well. And, and of course, I, I think that Matthew has made some, some very good points too. But if we've got a massive project which is never actually going to be built, we've got to be more imaginative about the micro solutions which uh, are, are, uh, do have a, a possibility of being built in succession. The whole point about these massive projects is that they never actually end up being built because they, the, the, the costs escalate uh, and uh, they become totally unsustainable. And the, I think the, that's the, what's happening here. We've been waiting for this for 30 years and it's still not going to happen. I mean, the Welsh Government is using the by-election as a further excuse for delay in taking a decision. Yeah, what, uh, Neil, if you're right, um, and, and, and I've no reason to think you're wrong, uh, about, about the Welsh Government simply not having the money, then shouldn't the UK Government um, stump up? I mean, this is a part of yeah. UK infrastructure, well, isn't it? You. you know, and the, the UK Government is paying for HS2, it's paying for Crossrail. Well, um, why well, shouldn't they pay well, for that's another white elephant. I mean, HS2 is now going to cost £100 billion. <laughs> That should never have been contemplated anyway. Um, so so there's a massive misallocation of resources here. Smaller solutions to big problems are much more likely to be successful. But you're quite right, the M4 is a massively important article arterial road and, and for the, the whole si- of the UK. Uh, and on some statistics I see, the city that would benefit most financially from the M4 relief road would be Bristol. Yeah, yeah. So why shouldn't the UK government pick, yeah, pick I, up I, the bill? I totally agree with you. This is one of the problems of devolution, of course. Uh, and uh, so this is where I have some sympathy with the Polish the Welsh Assembly Party, because uh, and, and I've changed my view in the last couple of years uh, since I've uh, been in, in the Assembly on this. I've seen how devolution has actually restricted our options rather than enhanced them in so many different ways. We are not going to go after that particular here. If I may say so, but but you're welcome to have brought it up. Um, Ruth Jones, um, this is a decision that will be made by by your colleagues in in Cardiff Bay. But you're from Newport, you're a candidate in Newport, you must have your own view. Yes, I do, obviously. Um, I've lived there, you know, all my life. So I do know all about the M4 and the issues that it's that caused, especially as people have already mentioned, things like a shunt on, on the, the M4 gridlocks Newport for the whole of the day. So that is an issue. Um, but it's not just a local issue. It is a UK wide issue because, you know, we have goods and traffic and people coming from Ireland through the ferries, through Milford Haven and Pembroke Dock. They use that. It's a gateway into Wales from England. And we know that since the bridge tolls have been uh, abolished, we've had an increase of at least 10% more traffic along that route. So it is a big issue and it needs to be dealt with now. Uh, we've waited, yeah, as everyone said, varying degrees, but at least 10 years we've waited for this. Um, and I know that the, the First Minister has the independent report with him. I, rem- I remember being briefed by John Redwood on it. I mean, that's, 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 <laughs> memory. That's, 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 how, that's how long we, uh, we waited. But you were firmly in support of it, you? Yes, because it, it's, it's not an either or. It's not either public transport or or the M4 relief road. We need both. And I think that's the important thing here. People have complex lives. The fact that you need to go to work, you need to come home again, doesn't tend to happen. People maybe have to drop kids off at a childminders, they need to go and see their elderly mum or whatever. These are issues that you cannot fit snugly into the public transport route. People need their cars. Now, how we deal with that is the issue. And certainly at the moment, there are people in Newport West who cannot go out of their houses with chronic lung disease on days when the pollution is really heavy from the M4 and and they, it is dangerous for their health. So I am concerned for these people. So they are you need in favour of the black or against it? It's it's not my decision. It's a devolved. We know that, but something has to be done. And obviously, I would be pressing Mark to Mark Drakeford to make sure that he he makes a decision quickly. And I would be working are you with for my it colleague. Against it? For, I, it it has to be the solution has to be sorted out by the in, following the independent report. I haven't seen the in, independent report. Five hundred pages. Mark Drake, Mark Drake has got it. Yeah, I want to see yeah, it. Uh, you don't need the independent report to be able to, to make some judgments. Um, 
the Gwent levels are, are an extraordinary landscape, um, not as well known as they should be. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if there are people listening here who haven't visited the Gwent levels, you should. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's incredible landscape. The thought of a, a motorway across that, it's not a nice thought, is it? OK, so if... If they decide on that route, and again, I'm not party to the decision, but I would be pressing for a decision, um, I would want to say that the Gwent levels would be disturbed. There would be 2% of it disturbed, not destroyed, disturbed. So 2% of the, of the Gwent levels. Now, yes, of course, we would mitigate and make sure that as little as possible was damaged there, but 2% compared with the lives and the health and the well-being of people in Newport. So a, a, price paying, a price worth paying, a price worth paying. It is an issue, and I understand the concerns people have there. But I think we need, we do need this. We need this sorted out quickly because the people in Newport West are suffering. Amelia so. Womack has be, very politely been holding her hand up, so I, 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 I will, I will defer to her. You wanted to come back. I mean, this is our natural heritage, and once it's gone, it's gone. And as you said, if there's, um, you said that you're also um, keen to have investment in sustainable transport, and that option is a key option, not just to make sure that we save the Gwent levels, but make sure that we mitigate against the worst effects of climate change. When we live on an estuary, when we at risk of flooding, it is vitally important that we protect our city from those predictions. And actually having clear public transport options that not only saves our wildlife and natural habitats and places that people go for recreation um, and people love and enjoy, but also making sure that we reduce our carbon emissions is so vital, not just to what we do today in Newport, but making sure we protect it for the future as well. John Jonathan from Plague Company, you, you want just to come admitted in well. The existing motorway already affects people's health badly. So you're now proposing to build another one so the entire city is enshrouded in motorways, living with the noise pollution and the particulate pollution 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, forever. <laughs> people have been sold a pup in relation to this motorway. What they haven't told people is when the bridge crosses the river, the deck of the road bridge will be at the height of the transporter bridge. The pillars on either side of that bridge will be twice the height of the transporter bridge. It will absolutely dominate our city. We will live with the noise pollution continuously. We already with the, live with the noise pollution from the M4 pretty much everywhere in Newport. Anywhere in Newport you can see the transporter bridge. You will see and hear this. It's unacceptable. We can't do... What we have facing here is a complete lack of leadership from the Labour Party at every level, locally and also in the National Assembly. Let me give a last word to Matthew Evans and then we'll move on. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I have learnt from the £45 million pounds they spent already on consultation is actually the pollution levels will go down in significant parts of Newport West. Mm, and that's an important yeah. aspect of it. And I live next to the motorway for years. And, you know, we it's clear that the pollution is a concern and pollution levels would go down if it's built road was built. Right, we'll move on now. Now, there, there are huge issues because this, you know, well, despite the febrile times, this isn't the Brexit by-election. There are loads of other issues that people have been um, bringing up. You know, we haven't touched on them, really. Austerity, public services, all of those sort of issues. So what I'm going to do in the final part of the programme is to, is to allow all of the candidates to bring up an issue that they've picked up on the doorstep, one they think that is of concern to the electors, and to say what they would do about it. We'll, we'll start off with um, Ryan Jones from the Liberal Democrats. Um, Ryan, what, what have you been hearing? What what is the big issue that we haven't so far discussed? I think it's the issue that comes up at um, every single election is, is our national health service. Um, the NHS is facing a funding crisis. Now, I know the decisions made on uh, how we run our NHS in Wales are devolved, but the funding that is uh, delivered to Wales for it is not a devolved issue. And one of the things that the Liberal Democrats have proposed is a penny in the pound on income tax to give that extra funding to the NHS. And I think one of the things that I'm, I've been hearing a lot on the doorstep and that I'm very passionate about is not only this increased funding that our NHS so desperately needs, but also we need much more joined up thinking on health and social care rather than having two fighting organisations trying to not pay for something which is then impacting the other uh, organisations. So, for example, if local council budgets are cut, then they're in a situation where they can't afford to pay for effective uh, social care and uh, aids and adaptations, which is then leading to delays in hospital discharges, massively increasing NHS costs. I think we need to look at this as a, as a, as a serious uh, 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 solution. Oh, 
I could have a penny for some time, every time I heard the politicians say, could we join up social care and NHS? I mean, <laughs> everyone knows that's a, that's a good idea, Ryan. The difficulty is getting getting it done. And absolutely, it is. And I think one of the things that we need to be conscious of is that um, the amount of parliamentary time that is being completely wasted on Brexit, uh, running around in circles, when we could be looking at uh, the, the major issues facing our society today, like climate change and, and, and like, like I've said, joining up the, the NHS and social care and having an effective solution. Ryan, thank you. The NHS and social care, uh, more spending on that. Uh, Jonathan Clark, what's the issue that you... you well, aside from... Up in? The usual issues, which are NHS, one of the big ones that comes up, aside from affordable housing and the homelessness in Newport, is actually policing. Residents in Newport are actually genuinely concerned about the lack of police numbers. They're genuinely worried about being out late at night. We've got a dysfunctional bus service. It's very difficult for people to get home after half past nine. I mean, we are down a significant number of police officers in Wales. We're down 500 police officers in Wales since 2010. In England and Wales, we're down 16,000 police officers since 2010. That's a funding-driven issue. That was a conscious choice by the Lib Dem Conservative government to do that, to cut police numbers. That was a bad choice. I mean, who could ever have foreseen if you reduced police numbers, there'd be a rise in crime? I mean, that's just not joined up thinking. People would like to see more police on the beat. They genuinely do. They feel, they, in some parts of Newport West, people feel quite unsafe uh, late at night and in the daytime as well. We need to do something about that. It's not a devolved issue yet, but it should be. We should have control of policing in Wales so we can decide on our own policing priorities and we would actually get extra funding if it was funded properly. Um, I, I don't know if people saw the Daily Mail yesterday. There was a piece on the high street in Swansea, um, which was a very depressing uh, piece about, uh, about the lack of policing, about problems with spice, uh, problems with sex workers, um, and there was a story of a, a, a businessman who reopened a pub and was shutting it, giving up. It, are those the sort of things you're seeing in Newport as well? They are coming. I mean, people are concerned about the communities they live in. I mean, we do have chronic homelessness in Newport, which I think is worse than Cardiff. I mean, some of the homeless people in Newport actually have jobs. They actually can't get onto the housing ladder. They can't get their foot up. But I think the background is if people are feeling unsafe in their communities, then they cease to be out and about. And that then has the effect of giving the streets over the people who are frightened to go out. It's that simple. Older people, younger people have concerns about it. It is a real issue on the doorstep. And, and it becomes a vicious spiral, then. Yeah. The, 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 the less people there are, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matthew? Um, surprise it or not, it's, it's about Newport itself, the city, and regeneration and, and the high street and the concerns which people raise. I mean, Gwent Police is budgets going up by £8.5 million this year. But clearly there are issues with the city centre and everybody wants a thriving city centre and I go in there regularly. In fact, after the hustings on Friday night, I went into the Burger King, so I shouldn't advertise necessarily <laughs> on the programme, but, uh, um, and I went outside and somebody came and said, uh, give me two pounds. Um, and there's a lot of it going on and things like the begging, we've made conscious efforts to try and say that we need to stop the aggressive begging and, and bank begging in, in Newport. And also, Newport City Centre, and when I was leader of the council, I introduced two hours free parking. I got the Friars Walk development up and running. We got Admiral into the city centre. We created jobs. And we need a strong, thriving city centre. We need more hotels being built. And we need to ensure that we've got record numbers of people in employment at the moment, but we need to ensure that's a priority. How, how do you get people... I mean, uh, the difficulty is that you've got Cardiff and Bristol either side of you, haven't you? And... and yeah. You know, I'm guessing 20, 30 years ago, people from the Grand Valleys and so on would naturally have gravitated down to Newport, uh, whereas now they go elsewhere. Yeah, they would have done. And we can't compete with Cardiff or Bristol. We've got to recognise we have our own unique selling points. Uh, and, and like I say, one of those is actually making easy access for, for both cars and buses for people to come into Newport. Um, people seem to forget that when you get on the train and you're coming down from sort of Abergavenny that way, it stops at Newport before it goes on to Cardiff. Now, if you have a reason to come in there, people will come in there. But we need to ensure, like you said, des city centre desperately needs more hotels, quality accommodation. We've got a fantastic market. We need more independent stores. And we need more leisure facilities in the city centre to bring people into Newport rather than face all the congestion as they try and get into Cardiff. Yeah, you mentioned Friars Walk. There, there are other things that are going on. I think the market is, is, uh, has got a plan at the moment, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but those are local government things. What should the UK government do? Because it's not just Newport. This is, you know, this is our town centres, our high streets across, across the country. 
Yeah, what, and, what can be done? The UK, like, UK government are getting better business relief in, uh, in England than they are in Wales. But the fact that the economy is growing, we've got growth in the economy and people are in jobs, helps in Wales as well. I mean, it's something which is an obvious... If we had more people unemployed, then clearly that would have an issue. But more people have got more money to spend in their pockets. It's about encouraging them to spend it in Newport. Uh, Ruth, let's go to you next. Okay. Uh, I know Jonathan is itching to leap in, but we've only got about eight minutes, so I need to make sure that everyone gets their chance on this. Um, and obviously the, the issues that have been mentioned already can be directly attributed to austerity. And obviously the last nine, ten years, we've had a Tory government making a decision that austerity is the way forward. It is a political decision and not a financial one. And as a result, Wales has been starved of at least £850 million worth of funding, which we would have had otherwise. Interesting that a billion pound can go to the DUP, but we can't get our fair funding here in Wales. And that does have impact directly on the people of Newport West. So things like um, universal credit, the fact that people have to wait five weeks maybe for their first, uh, at least for their first payment, is, is directly attributable to the reason why homelessness is rising. That's one of the big issues. I work, uh, I volunteer at the local night shelter with Eden Gate. And I, I see people, I talk to people there who are out and on the streets, homeless, through no fault of their own, many, many complex issues. But one of the main ones is the fact that the austerity cuts are biting very, very hard. Um, it's interesting. Jonathan mentioned homelessness. You did uh, as, as well. Um, is Newport pay... Um, Newport's house prices are rising, I think, faster than anywhere else in Wales, partly because the tolls have gone on the bridge. Um, that, in some ways, is a good thing, Right. But is it having unforeseen consequences as well? Um, certainly the people I, I talk to in, in the homeless shelter, they, it's not directly the fact that they can't get on the housing ladder like that. It's, it's having safe, affordable, rented accommodation as well is important. And that's a big issue for us here in Newport. We don't tend to have the, um, the, the issue, the, 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 the decent accommodation or enough of it, plentiful. That's what we need. But it is an issue. But also it comes back to crime as well. And, you know, Jonathan's mentioned the crime issues. But we have lost £30 million from the budget in Gwent, which has left over 100 police officers down within the within the Gwent police force. And that has a massive effect because you don't see the police around. They're not a visible presence. And we know things like the crime, the drug issues maybe that we do have, as, as, as the big cities do have across the UK, those sorts of things can be mitigated against by having the, the presence of the neighbourhood policing. Thank you. Uh, Amelia, uh, you get to go last, but one, Neil Hamilton somehow managed to go first and last on this program. I, 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 I don't quite how he managed that, Amelia. <laughs> I actually think that agree with the point that people feel that we need to rejuvenate our city centre and rejuvenate our local economy. Most people, Newport is a resilient city and people are proud of their city, port and proud, as the saying goes. And I think that what we uh, need to be making sure that we invest in is ensuring that we've got that futures thinking for our local economy. Now, for me, when we look at um, rece uh, recession, and it, to me, it's clear that austerity has really bitten hard on Newport. It's a part of the very fabric of our communities in many sense. Um, I mean, and when we de delve into the impact of universal credit, yet again, it just shows the harm that happens to r real people as a result of a government policy that has, doesn't have people at the heart of it. But for me, I, what I want to see is um, in the Roosevelt had a vision of a new deal that got America out of recession. And we know that the Newport was the centre, was one of the most important cities in the entire world during the Industrial Revolution. The Green Industrial Revolution is just around the corner. It's an opportunity to make sure that we use the skills that we have in Newport to make sure that we're delivering um, that Green Industrial Revolution, whether that's bringing it, building parts for renew renewables, for transport, and bringing those jobs here, making sure that they're jobs for now that, um, as well as for the future will help rejuvenate that local economy but I also think there's an opportunity to rejuvenate the high street you talked about um, people coming from the valleys into Newport one of the areas that I think is clear to me is the night economy was um, a place where a lot of people would come into Newport from different areas um, and I think that that really um, embedded... TJs and all of that yes yeah, exactly yeah. and I, it really embedded our cultural scene as well and I think we have a lot of talented people in Newport we have so much culture and I'd like that to be supported and enriched rather than, whether that's looking at business rates to support that because I think we've got so much in our city but it just needs to be encouraged and making sure that it's promoted. Um, if I can give a little tip to our to our listeners since Amelia mentioned culture 
worth searching out on YouTube is the Goldie Looking Chain <laughs> tribute to Paul Flynn, yes. uh, which is deeply, deeply <laughs> moving and very Goldie Looking Chain, I have to say as well. Uh, Neil Hamilton, you're, you, you get to go last. An issue that you've been picking up on. Well, this. poverty. I mean, poverty is Wales's big problem. It's 75%, Wales's uh, income on average is 75% of the UK. You know, Wales is the poorest part of the United Kingdom. There are parts of Wales which are the poorest parts of Western Europe. My region of Midwest Wales have got some of the poorest. Uh, and uh, in, th- this is an endemic problem in Wales, which both parties have failed to address in uh, Labour and Tories in the, the last however many decades that they've been in charge. You know, the DUP got an extra billion pounds for Northern Ireland because their votes mattered in the House of Commons. Uh, Wales has a poor deal out of the, the distribution of money between the, the nations of the United Kingdom. We, we know that we get much less per head from the UK government than they do in Scotland. You know, my vote in the House of Commons will be used to ensure that we get a better deal for Wales and for Newport from the UK government uh, to change the Barnet formula to something which is based on need rather than just on some historical fiction that uh, arose out of the collapse of the Labour government in 1978-79. You know, the £39 billion pounds that Theresa May wants to give to the EU for nothing in, in exchange should be used to benefit right. those who are uh, at the bottom of the heap in, so, in this country. So we started and ended with Neil Hamilton and started and ended with Brexit. It was ever thus <laughs> these days. You can hear the next programme live on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock on Radio Wales. And keep across all all the political developments in Wales and beyond throughout the week on BBC Radio Wales.